Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar presentation. The time right now is about 1 p.m. on the East Coast. Um, today is Tuesday, September 20th. You joined uh, those of us here at the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership and NTAP partner for the Bureau of Primary Healthcare with HRSA. Uh, for our um, training webinar, primarily for health center-based medical legal partnerships, but I do want to emphasize that actually anyone tuning in from any type of healthcare institution, civil legal services, or social services should benefit from the content that you'll hear from our subject matter experts and partners in MLP and social services uh, today. Today's webinar is called Understanding the Current Social Needs of Health Center Patients. Welcome everyone. I'm Bethany Hamilton, co-director of the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership. Let's go to the next slide. All right, as mentioned um, at the top of the webinar, um, this is a HRSA funded uh, webinar event. Um, the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership, along with 21 other organizations, are funded to provide training and technical assistance to health centers. And our specific work at the, here at the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership is really helping health centers um, improve how they screen for and address the social needs that have legal underpinnings of health center patient populations. Let's go to the next slide. All right, a little bit more of the housekeeping, just to make sure everyone joining today's webinar knows how to engage with us, the National Center team that's also on, and of course our subject matter experts. So everyone has joined on mute. We are using Zoom webinar today. Um, however, please, please, please do engage using the Q&A as well as the chat. So we'll be keeping track of questions that come in primarily using the questions and answer pane in your Zoom. It show up, should show up as an icon with the marking Q&A. Um, but if you do happen to utilize the chat and we'll get used to using the chat in just a moment here, um, uh, we'll try our best to address questions that may have come in via chat as well. Um, you can activate captioning, closed captioning on Zoom by um, clicking on live transcript and then show subtitle. If you're in Zoom live right now, you may also see that at the top of your Zoom uh, webinar screen, there's a prompt about the live transcription or closed captioning service. If you do need any assistance on the panel today are the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership staff, Reha and Catherine, and they'll be happy to if you private chat them, um, or if you don't, you can just uh, send a message to them um, directly and let them know that you need some technical assistance. Of course, yes, we are recording this webinar and we will be sharing both the recording as well as the slides um, through a PDF document posted to the National Center for Medical Legal Partnerships website. And if you registered in advance, you will be receiving a follow-up email uh, that will let you know where you can find that information quickly and efficiently. Okay, let's go to the next slide. A um, little bit of an icebreaker, since we are on a health center MLP focused webinar, take a moment to, um, as you log on, or if you are already logged on and you've joined us, go to the Zoom chat. And here's a trivia question for you. Let's make it a little fun first. Um, the nation's first community health centers were launched as a small demonstration program as a part of which president's Office of Economic Opportunity? Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon or Clinton? So just type your answer into the chat. Was it Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, or Clinton? That is the president, who's the president who launched as a part of their Office of Economic Opportunity, the nation's first health center programs. If you need a hint, there's a hint on the screen. The year was 1965. So if you know your US presidential history, you'll uh, definitely get the answer to this one, 1965. Okay, so a lot of folks are, <laughs> Margaret saying everyone stole her answer and people are typing LBJ. Um, I'm gonna ask one of our panelists who is LBH. <laughs> so we'll ask Brad Carallo, who is LBH? I don't know that president. All right, yes. Um, in fact, thank you everyone for engaging. Um, the answer, the correct answer is President Johnson. Um, so uh, health centers, nation's very first community health centers were launched as a part of the demo program uh, that was a part of the Office of Economic Opportunity. Um, further, um, icebreaker, and I promise this is the last of the icebreakers. 
It would be particularly helpful for our subject matter experts and panelists who are joining us here today to know a little bit more about you in the audience. And we also like to do this to help you know about each other um, to help you further network and connect. So tell us about you. Take a moment to please take uh, use the chat of, in Zoom again and let us know what type of organization you represent. Do you represent a health center or a health center lookalike program? a different type of healthcare organization, such as palliative care clinics, nursing homes, hospitals? Do you represent civil legal services or other legal services? Perhaps you're from a law school. Do you represent an academic or research institution, public policy organization, or other? Perhaps we're joined today by um, some governments, whether it's state, local, county, um, city or federal government officials. So let us know uh, who you are and where you're from. Again, this is very helpful for our speakers. As many of you have been presenters, you know how helpful it is to know who's in the audience. All right, and so it looks like we do have a really um, good representation from the medical legal partnership world here. There are several legal services folks who do have MLPs and um, really nice highlight here. There's someone with an MLP program uh, that partners with a nurse home visiting program. So that's awesome to have you. Thank you for joining us today. We also have some MLPs that work with VA um, medical systems, um, state uh, PCAs, our primary care association folks have joined us here today, as well as um, a grad student from University of Southern California who's doing a capstone project on MLPs. Um, great to see you all here today. We have integrated health systems. And if you all keep scrolling through the chat, you see that we have coalition folks like Mile High Health Alliance out in Colorado um, and several others who are supportive of or trying to learn more about medical legal partnership. Thank you all for engaging. I did promise there were two icebreakers. However, I can also promise that there will be additional opportunities to engage through polls as well as through chat. So thank you for engaging on this initial icebreaker. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so you are joining us actually on the first of a series of webinars. Um, over the last couple of years, the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership has been utilizing our webinars and learning collaboratives to help disseminate the training and information uh, that is contained in our Health Center MLP Toolkit. A screenshot of that, um, that uh, title or that covers page, excuse me, of the toolkit is on the slide on the screen. Um, so when you go to our website, you'll see it just as it appears, bringing lawyers onto the health center care team to promote patient and community health. I want to make a footnote for everyone in the audience today that this health center MLP toolkit was inspired by um, and built upon several other toolkits and resources created by MLPs from other types of healthcare institutions, such as the VA um, guide, um, the readiness guide for starting VA-based uh, MLPs. Um, and we do believe that it can continue to be utilized um, for helping to inspire and teach others how to start non-health center based MLP. So even if you are not with a community health center, you're joining us with us today on the webinar, we did strongly encourage you to take a look at the health center um, MLP toolkit, as well as other toolkits that are referenced therein. Um, this is the first of a five part webinar series, um, understanding the current social needs of health center patients. But if you continue to tune in, follow our newsletter, you'll get to hear from MLP practitioners about what current best practices or challenges you can, they can help you overcome in terms of developing screening, referral and service delivery workflows. Um, we'll then um, in the month of November, actually hear from Ellen Lawton, Kate Marple, some of those throwbacks, right, who um, helped to really build the National Center and the MLP movement, right? And you've heard from them before, they'll come and join us to talk about workforce development, trainings to help staff of MLPs better identify um, health harming legal needs of patients. Um, then we'll actually in two parts talk about how MLPs are engaging in or can help to utilize policy initiatives um, to get their work done. And um, we'll also be doing both a webinar and a learning collaborative on evaluation and sustainability for MLPs. So keep tuning in to hear more about uh, how to build a health center MLP through our webinars. And uh, as you heard, at least one of those will have a learning collaborative uh, that stems from it. All right, thank you. Let's go to the next slide. 
One of the very first lessons in our Health Center MLP toolkit, and many of you probably tuned in back in 2020 and again in 2021 to hear and deep dive how to actually decide in an initial nine conversations, how to start your MLP, what are you going to address? But the very first conversation that we recommend in the nine conversations as a part of the toolkit is really taking a look at the social determinants of health and asking as potential partners, right, or as current partners, if you're improving upon your MLP or expanding upon it, what SDOH problems do we really want to address? We know medical legal partnerships and civil legal services providers uh, work together uh, with healthcare providers at various types of institutions to prevent evictions. Many of them also work on disability discrimination or disability benefits cases. Some of those um, partnerships, um, let's go to the next slide. Some of those partnerships decide that in addition to certain types of cases, we're actually gonna screen for all types of social needs for all patients. They continue in their development conversations some of them to say perhaps in certain types of cases like our housing cases we're actually going to specifically target a patient population and then we're still going to with that target population actually boil down to or pair it down to specific social needs that we're screening for others again in the mlp field have decided we're going to screen all patients for all social needs um, and not do the all patients so, uh, specific social needs um, these, there's no one way about it. Sure, ideally you're able to utilize your screening tools, standardize them, and you'll hear a little bit more from one of our NTAP partners about one of the um, uh, industry standards for, this, uh, for the screening tools um, in the field right now and what they have found in terms of its utilization. Um, but that is not the be all end all. Do what you can in terms of screenings, but definitely do not skip this question. It's very important to ask what social determinants of health problems do we want to address and making a decision about the specific population and what social needs you're going to address. If it's all great. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, <clears throat> we have been, I think through this, um, Health Center MLP Toolkit Series doing deep dives. But we've been doing these deep dive webinars while we've also been through a pandemic. And we knew that during the pandemic, which is now in the endemic stage, we were also um, navigating multiple crises running at the exact, operating or excuse me, happening at the exact same time. So we had a housing crisis, which was not just about shelter over your head, but also habitable housing um, such as being sure or ensuring that your patients and populations that you serve had utilities. We also saw immigration crises playing out. So for individuals with immigration status or in mixed status families, we saw that there were policy implications that threatened the health of those families. We were dealing with multiple crises at the same time. And in that chaos, somehow we managed to overcome, but it is, it is very, very important that it was, we continue to resurface from all of the crisis mode that we've been in, that we actually understand what the current social needs are that health center patient populations are facing. So we designed this webinar with everyone in mind across disciplines to hit reset and make sure we understand what the data sets currently say, what the reports that are out there actually mean and what tools you can actually use to continue to um, screen for and better address those social needs. And especially for us, uh, the ones with the legal underpinnings, those health harming legal needs for the patient populations that you serve. So our objectives today are really to help um, everyone joining our webinar today, especially our health center friends, um, better understand the current data on social needs of the patient populations and how they shifted um, tremendously during the pandemic. You'll also hear a little bit about what some of the challenges were that health centers faced and how they overcame it, <clears throat> overcame those challenges. And you'll hear about how MLPs can partner uh, with those health centers to address those challenges. You'll also hear from our uh, speakers from APCHO about how PREPARE, a screening tool that you should all be very familiar with, was really leveraged as one of the most powerful tools and continues to be leveraged as one of the most powerful tools to collect 
understand and address health-related social needs of health center patient populations. We, may, we know many of you have taken up an integrated prepare into your EHRs, um, but I do think the information that you'll hear today um, should be applicable uh, across different types of screening tools that you might be using in your EHRs. We encourage you all to um, please feel free again to utilize the Q&A. Let us know if you're running into any technical difficulties. Let me introduce our speakers. And then the NCMLP team will also be um, plugging some links to uh, the various um, resources that are shared because we wanna make sure you have that handy as you await um, the slide deck to be shared. So let's go to the next slide with the speaker so I can let you know who's joining today. <clears throat> um, what I'll do is, and I wanna apologize to our speakers, I'm gonna mention your names, where you're from so that I don't, um, uh, delay too much further for your primary presentations. Um, so first and foremost, um, for the audience, you'll be hearing from Brad Carallo. Um, he's a senior policy analyst for a program on Medicaid and the uninsured at Kaiser Family Foundation or KFF. Um, you will hear more from him about KFF's 2021 National Survey of Community Health Centers. Um, the Geyer Gibson uh, program here at the George Washington University partners uh, with KFF as well as APCHO um, on conducting that research and that report. Um, and um, I would encourage everyone to take a look at it and let Brad know if you have questions for him as he um, proceeds through his presentation. We will also be joined by Rosie Chang. We're director of research. Many of you know Rosie, I've heard from her, seen her at conferences. Um, uh, really presenting on Prepare. That's the tool that's shared between APCHO and NAC and others and um, has truly become an industry standard for screenings, um, excuse me, screening and referrals, uh, an integrated um, approach um, standardized um, in the EHRs around at health centers around the country. So you'll be hearing from Rosie Moore about Prepare as well as the SEOH findings that they've recently gathered at, um, for the team at APCHO. APCHO is one of our NTAP partners and something that uh, it would be remiss of me not to mention that Brad Corallo actually um, uh, worked at the National Association of Community Health Centers. So he's a part of the health center family. Um, we are also joined by, and he will be around in case we have questions. We do have Albert from APCHO, Albert Eisen, he's in the panel. And so um, he'll be joining us during the Q and A. Um, Brad, Rosie, Albert, thank you so much for joining us today. Brad, I'm gonna turn it over to you to begin your presentation. Thanks everyone. Great, thanks Bethany. And hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, as Bethany said, my name is Brad Carallo uh, from the Kaiser Program on Medicaid uh, for the Uninsured. Uh, my contact info, if you hit the next slide, you can reach me uh, there if you have questions. I'm also, uh, well, we have plenty of time to answer questions today. And uh, today I'll primarily be presenting on the survey that Bethany mentioned that KFF conducts in partnership uh, with the Geiger Gibson Program at the George Washington University with support from the RCHN Community Health Foundation. Uh, and pulling out the subset of findings, particularly looking at the changing patient needs that we captured in our latest survey. So next slide, please. So a bit more about the survey. As I mentioned, it's conducted in, in partnership uh, with uh, Geiger Gibson and RCHN. Um, and essentially, uh, for the findings we're presenting here, the way the survey works, as we sent a questionnaire to every federally funded health center in the 50 states and DC, and they were to be completed by the health center CEO or the, the CEO's designee. In total, we received complete responses from about 357 health centers for a 27% response rate. And uh, we consider this to be a, a mostly annual survey and that we completed most years, particularly leading up to the pandemic, although we did take a break in 2020. Um, and generally, you know, uh, the survey is meant to be kind of a broad assessment of health center patients, patient needs and services with a focus on uh, national policy issues. And so obviously with this latest survey that was fielded in late 2021, uh, from September to December, 2021, the focus was on changes during the pandemic. We also carried forward a few questions from uh, previous surveys about S 
substance use disorder to see uh, how some particular uh, needs have changed. Um, I should note as a limitation that because our survey is, you know, designed to be very broad and cover a lot of policy issues, one of the main limitations we have is that we don't really get into uh, the nitty gritty uh, details about some policies or how partnerships uh, or certain services may be implemented on the ground. We do sometimes, but it may not always be the case. And it's certainly one of the limitations uh, in reporting out these data. Uh, but, you know, despite that limitation, um, you know, we do capture a pretty broad picture of health center patient needs and how well health center services and capacity uh, are aligned with meeting those needs. And then the last thing I'll note about this is um, I'm presenting kind of a subset of findings from our survey report, which is available uh, in full on the KFF website. Um, next slide, please. So just to kind of set the context uh, for where health centers are at the time, uh, at the time of uh, when we were fielding this in 2021, um, like many other providers, health centers saw a, a pretty sizable decrease in the number of patients in 2020. Um, you know, largely due to social distancing protocols, patients, you know, avoiding the risk of infection, people avoiding non-essential care. Um, and in total, the number of patients dropped from 29.8 million in 2019 to 28.6 million in 2020, uh, which basically amounts to a decrease of 1.2 million patients or a 4% drop in 2020. It also represents the first time in decades that health centers saw a year over year decrease in patients. And, uh, but fortunately in 2021, uh, the number of patients rebounded to 30.2 million, uh, a new record high. Um, but unfortunately not all patient groups have rebounded to their 2019 levels. So for example, uh, looking at the number of children patients uh, under age 18, uh, they're still about 6% lower compared to their 2019 patient levels. The number of patients experiencing homelessness were about 11% lower than their patient counts in 2019, uh, as well as some other uh, demographic groups uh, shown in the slide here, among others that I did not include too. And there's lots of reasons for this. Uh, I'm sure it's very population specific as most things are in the health center world. Uh, maybe the shift to telehealth uh, using particular services that may or may not be more amenable to telehealth, um, closing sites during the pandemic, particularly like school-based sites as schools went virtual. Uh, there could be a lot of reasons. I don't personally know which ones they are, but we will be looking in future reports for 2022 and later on to see if the remaining segments of the patient population rebound back to pre-pandemic levels overall. Uh, next slide, please. Similar de to declining patients, health centers also saw a drop in visits, uh, particularly in 2021, uh, particularly for in-person services. Telehealth visits uh, skyrocketed during the pandemic, which didn't surprise many people, but uh, not enough to offset the declines for in-person services. So telehealth grew from less than 1% of all visits in 2019 to about 25% in 2020 and 21% in 2021. And in all, telehealth accounts for about 26 million visits in 2021, up from less than a half million uh, in 2019. Moreover, uh, the number of uh, health centers utilizing telehealth expanded from less than half uh, to virtually all health centers as of 2021. And at its peak during the height of the pandemic, uh, nearly ha roughly half of visits were conducted via telehealth, according to weekly survey data from the Bureau of Primary Health Care within HRSA. More recent survey data from early, sep er, er, yeah, early September, earlier this month, uh, found that uh, telehealth use is still somewhat declining in about 14% of visits, and that weekly survey data uh, were conducted via telehealth. So, uh, it seems that from the 2021 going forward, telehealth use may be shrinking, uh, at least according to the survey data, and it may continue even as more telehealth flexibilities uh, are that were temporary and related to the pandemic, uh, meant to increase access temporarily, may be phased out uh, as time goes on, particularly uh, as we're looking towards the end of the public health emergency. Uh, next slide, please. 
So while telehealth helped to boost access to care during the pandemic, uh, health centers uh, reported uh, quite a few unique challenges in providing these virtual services, notably a lack of internet access among patients and a lack of comfort with technology for telehealth were the most common challenges. Virtually all health centers, about 97% of respondents, reported that a lack of internet access among patients was either a major or a minor challenge for providing telehealth. And when we say lack of internet access, yes, we are talking about internet access in the home, but that also includes things like limited data or limited minutes on your phone uh, to use for telehealth. Uh, it could also mean uh, no personal computer or phone access within the home uh, to allow, uh, to facilitate access to the internet. In addition, that 93% of health centers, oh, there we go. 93% of health centers responded that a lack of comfort using telehealth technology was also a bar barrier. And in addition, uh, health centers also cited some operational challenges, uh, though a little bit less frequently. And these include 70% of health centers reporting inadequate reimbursement for audio only services as a challenge, uh, operational costs for operating a telehealth program, which uh, don't include uh, the purchasing of equipment and the lack of comfort using telehealth technology among uh, providers, uh, which we ask separately from patients. Next slide, please. At the same time with these declining visits and services and the pivot to telehealth, uh, health centers were also being asked to step up new COVID services. And uh, along the way, they also became key partners, uh, certainly at the federal level and most, uh, and also, you know, at the state and local levels too, and promoting a more equitable response uh, to the pandemic. And both the, the Trump and Biden administrations created federal a number of supply programs for health centers to distribute vaccines and therapeutics, in addition to at-home rapid tests, N95 masks, uh, and the like to slow the spread of the virus in underserved communities. And according to under, I'm, I'm sorry, according to survey data uh, collected by the Bureau of Primary Healthcare, health centers have uh, to date administered more than 21 million vaccinations with roughly 70% administered to people of color. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, health centers also saw an increase in the number of patients experiencing opioid use disorder disorder or OUD. Uh, this represents a continuation of a trend from earlier surveys which asked about which asked the same set of questions related to opioid use disorder and medication assisted treatment or, or MAT, M-A-T, which is considered the standard of care for OUD. In 2021, nearly half or about 48 percent of health centers reported an increase in patients experiencing OUD, including prescription or uh, non-prescription opioid use disorder. The number of health centers providing uh, medication-assisted treatment also increased in 2021, with 71% of health centers reporting that they provide MAD medications, MAD therapy, or both on site, as those are both uh, medications and the therapy are two components of MAD. More health centers also report that they have the capacity to treat all patients uh, who are seeking MAD services at their health centers, growing from 53% in 2019 to 61% in 2021. So while that, that's an improvement and you know we're very glad to see it, it does on the other hand mean that there are still about 39% of health centers uh, that we surveyed providing MAT services, but Donas reported that they did not have the capacity to treat all the patients seeking MAT. Next slide, please. Following other national trends, we also saw an uptick in mental health needs and other substance use disorders during the pandemic. Uh, at the same time, health centers continued building out mental health and SUD services that were already in place at many health centers uh, prior to the pandemic. For example, in 2019, nearly all health centers employed mental health professionals and most employed SUD professionals as well. By late 2021, 64% of health centers reported that they added a new mental health or SUD service uh, whether that was in person, via telehealth, or both. The most commonly added service, whether in person or virtually, was individual therapy, added by 47% of responding health centers. Additionally, just over 30% of health centers added counseling as part of uh, medication-assisted therapy, and a similar amount added medications as part of medication-assisted therapy. 
roughly 20% of health centers newly added services uh, for group therapy or support groups. Next slide, please. The, uh, obviously with the pandemic causing major disruptions to the economy, we also, as Bethany was talking about, saw increased need for certain social and supportive services here. And health centers provide a range of these services, both on site and through referral. Uh, so for example, all, all health centers provide case management. Uh, it is a requirement of the health center program. Uh, and then others may provide a number of other services, maybe transportation, interpretation, or some other combination, depending on multiple factors, such as the needs of the patient population, available funding, or reimbursement. Um, and this figure here shows several of these services that we asked about in our survey, uh, as certainly not a comprehensive list. And among the health centers that provided or referred for each of these services in the figure, the largest increase or the largest increase in patients' non-medical needs were for housing and food and nutrition. Uh, I'll put that another way because this is this graph is a little tricky uh, to interpret. Uh, so among the health centers that provided or referred for housing-related services, 69 of them reported they were seeing more patients uh, currently than they were before the pandemic. Similarly, for those providing or referring for food and nutrition-related services, 63% saw an increase in patients seeking those services as well. Um, roughly half of health centers providing or referring for transportation and domestic violence services also reported increases. And uh, important for this group, among health centers providing or referring for legal services, roughly a third, 33%, reported an increase in patients needing legal aid. Uh, one thing also to take note of is that about 29% of those health centers selected don't know if the number of patients seeking legal aid increased, decreased, or stayed about the same before the pandemic. Uh, and you know, in combination with, we're seeing very few people saying it actually decreased. Uh, this 33% of uh, health centers reporting increased legal needs uh, may be an underestimate. Next slide, please. When it comes to providing social and supportive services, staffing, lack of reimbursement and insufficient physical spaces were among the most common challenges reported by health centers. 85% of health centers look at staffing shortages as a challenge for providing enabling services and roughly seven in 10 selected lack of reimbursement and lack of physical space for providing enabling services as a challenge. There are also many other common challenges, uh, including approximately six in 10 health centers that selected insufficient grant funding uh, too many competing priorities and waiting lists uh, for other services as well. Next slide, please. And when we think about challenges overall, uh, we basically, we asked health centers to select what are your top three challenges of a list that we provided for them. Uh, and again, uh, we saw that staffing issues were at the top. Uh, specifically recruiting, uh, specifically 78% selected staff recruitment and 54 selected staff uh, retention as a top challenge. Uh, again, we saw that uh, in challenges for enabling services, which I showed just before. Um, we also asked for challenges for mental health and SUD services. And again, I, I didn't show that slide, but that was uh, workforce issues were also at the top there. So that was very much a common theme. The workforce issues were a common theme uh, when we were asking about challenges at health centers in our survey. Nearly a third of health centers uh, selected inadequate physical space as an issue, and 24 selected the decrease in patient visits as the top challenges. Uh, and there were several others. We gave them quite a list uh, that they selected, including changes to the 340B drug discount program, increasing cost, increased patient demand, and high numbers of uninsured patients. Uh, next slide, please. Now I just want to quickly uh, highlight some findings related to the end of the continuous enrollment requirement in Medicaid, which is going to touch all uh, Medicaid enrollees, including all Medicaid patients at health centers. And I'll also note that uh, while this is partly included, uh, we, we do a very short summary of this in our long report. We also include a standalone short policy brief uh, covering uh, the survey questions related to this particular uh, uh, issue for the unwinding of the requirement. Um, so, and you can find that on the KFF website. Uh, next slide, please. So 
So uh, the continuous enrollment requirement was, uh, was implemented at the start of the pandemic uh, and included in the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act of 2020. And in short, it essentially stops state Medicaid agencies from disenrolling people from Medicaid coverage. There are some exceptions, like if a person moves out of state or they voluntarily withdraw from coverage, uh, but otherwise states cannot remove them from the Medicaid rolls. And generally the idea behind this was to avoid coverage loss and churning uh, during the pandemic. Now in return uh, for stopping disenrollments, uh, states will receive an increase in their federal match rates uh, for Medicaid spending, uh, which people call the FMAP rate. Um, and the continuous enrollment requirement is tied to the length of the PHE. It will end in the month following the end of the PHE. And currently the, the PHE, the public health emergency, runs through mid-October. Um, it's kind of assumed that it will be extended for another days into mid-January because the Biden administration has promised to provide a 60-day warning to states before they end the public health emergency. And since we didn't receive that warning, it's assumed it will be renewed at least once more uh, going forward. Now, as a result of the um, Medicaid, or the continuous enrollment requirement, we've had record enrollment numbers. Uh, 89 million people are enrolled in Medicaid as of May. That's up from 70 million or almost 25% from before the pandemic. Uh, so at the end of the PHE, states will start disenrolling people. Uh, and they'll working, start working through disenrollments and then uh, disenrolling people who uh, they either find no longer eligible or they cannot complete the redetermination. So that means people who, uh, you know, some people who get disenrolled, you know, maybe don't qualify anymore or maybe they have another source of coverage and don't qualify. But what we're concerned about are the people who fall through the cracks, uh, typically people who may be disenrolled for procedural reasons people who maybe for some reason or another don't complete their redetermination, maybe they never received their renewal packet requesting information about their income and they never returned it. And so the state can't complete the redetermination and they're disenrolled. Um, so we'll be keeping an eye on that. Uh, and that's also an area where many Medicaid enrollees, including patients, uh, may need assistance, particularly completing the process potentially filing appeals if uh, they've been wrongfully terminated and uh, if they no longer qualify and need help uh, finding new coverage possibly uh, through the marketplace. So there's lots of ways that health centers can uh, step up to help uh, uh, enrollees going through this experience. Uh, next slide, please. And so in our survey and keeping in mind that we fielded that survey in late 2021, health centers plans may have changed or probably have changed since then. We asked health centers how they were, if and how they were preparing for the end of the continuous enrollment requirements. Uh, and overall, uh, we found that about 63%, oh, I'm sorry, next slide, please. So uh, when we asked health centers if and how they're preparing, we found that at least about 63% were doing something or they were planning to take one of the actions shown here, so a majority of health centers, and possibly more now that some time has passed. Specifically, 47, or nearly half, said that they would be scheduling uh, appointments with patients to assist with renewing coverage. A similar amount said that they were sending reminders to patients or planning to do that. Uh, similarly, less than half, or just under half, uh, were also taking or planning actions to identify patients at risk of losing coverage and flagging them for reminders. Um, and then uh, uh, about 40% were also planning to increase staff time or hiring additional staff. Um, additionally, uh, about 5% said that they were uh, already taking steps to coordinate with legal services organizations uh, to assist with appealing coverage terminations. And an additional 24% uh, were planning to do so. Next slide. So going forward, uh, we'll we'll look to see if uh, not just the total patients, but a lot of subgroups of patients bounce back to their pre-pandemic levels. We'll also see what's going on with telehealth and how uh, health centers uh, or health center patients prefer um, to access those services, whether virtually or in person, and how the phase out of certain telehealth flexibility impacts that as well. 
We will probably also see health centers continue to be an important source of mental health and SUD services, particularly in the opioid crisis. And then uh, with ongoing economic conditions in the wake of the pandemic, uh, those could certainly continue to push up demand for social and supportive services from health centers too. And finally, in the months following uh, the end of the PHE and the continuous enrollment requirements, whenever that ends, millions of health center patients uh, will undergo redeterminations and many will need help completing that process or applying for new coverage. Notably, uh, this could also impact the payer mix at health centers too, particularly if uh, the number of uninsured patients uh, increases. So uh, that's a lot of information. I'll stop there. Um, thank you uh, for having me. Thank you so much, Brad. It was super helpful and informative to help us understand what the current social needs are of the health center patient population based on the survey that was conducted in 2021 and what's anticipated to become emerging needs and issues um, that health centers and legal services uh, providers can collaborate on to address as we um, look at the end of the PHE. So we'll have some more questions for you um, towards the end. Let's see if there are any questions that came in for Brad before we move to hearing from Rosie uh, from APCHO. Um, Catherine, I'm definitely going to need your help now, um, but I did see two questions pop in. So Catherine, I'll get the two that just came up at the bottom of the list, and then I'll ask you if you can help me call out any that are specifically for Brad that came in before these last two. Um, Brad, uh, I know Viviana Bishop is asking if you might be able to share your email address. You shared your Twitter handle. I know you're at KFF and you may have to run that by the organization. So I'll defer to you on that. Um, and apologies, Viviana, if you've got to actually log on to Twitter to follow Brad. Um, but you can also sign up for KFF updates. A lot of us do receive our direct um, news and updates and information on those reports from Brad. And lucky. Lucky for everyone, Brad actually put his email address in the chat. Thank you so much, Brad. Next question is um, from Lori Endress. I would like to know or hear a little bit more about how case management um, does not cover SEOH or legal services. Um, Lori, I might need you to explain or expound upon that a little bit more. It, um, case management is a requirement uh, for HRSA funded programs. And so, in the chat, I just to help, um, uh, and Brad, I'll, I'm gonna turn to you in just a second, but I just wanna note that when this question was first posed, I did plug into the chat a direct link to her says document or guidance document called service descriptors for form 5A. It's a document that health centers fill out to um, uh, explain what required as well as um, uh, optional services that are, are the not required. Um, services they're providing. And case management is one of the required services for the health center programs. Um, there is a description of what case management amounts to. And for those of you in the MLP space from legal services, you'll also see um, where legal so services falls in the enabling services category of work. Um, Brad, so the specific question that came in from Lori, I'm not sure if you want to take a stab at this, is um, that she'd like to hear a little bit more about how case management does not cover SDOH or legal services. Uh, sure. As, as, as I understand it, you know, a case manager can help connect you to certain resources, uh, whether that's referring for other social needs, wh whichever SDOH or maybe even legal needs that that might be. And uh, to the extent that they can maybe help people or maybe just refer them to someone probably depends on how well those other services are integrated within the health center. Like if they have a medical legal partnership integrated within as one of the providers, that might be a bit easier. Um, and maybe if, and I'm wondering if uh, uh, she was asking because I didn't show it on my slide as one of the services that we captured or asked about in our survey. And we actually chose not to ask about that uh, because it was a required service. So in case that was the question, that's also uh, why you didn't see it on the slide. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Lori, let us know if we understood your question um, correctly. Uh, if we did not capture that, um, maybe just uh, direct message us so we understand um, what you're asking uh, specifically about. Um, Catherine, I'm going to uh, ask you if we've got any other questions that came up in the chat that were uh, directed towards Brad. Yeah, there were um, a couple kind of earlier on 
Um, one that asked, while patient populations dropped, did the legal SDOH problems double or increase? Um, and then there was a follow-up to that asking uh, if there's data regarding the number of people who don't even make it through a clinic door because of SDOH. Um, I'll take the second one first, and I may have asked you to repeat the, the first initially, but as far as for the data on the people that don't make it uh, to a clinic because of SDOH, and I'm sure uh, Rosie or Albert uh, can speak to this probably better than I can, uh, because this is their bread and butter. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the data that we're looking at, uh, we won't capture that, and that's one of the major limitations uh, of it. Um, that said, you know, we do try to look at the general community, at population indicators that people come from. You can maybe use census data, things like that. But uh, for our survey, we're asking about patients that come through the door. So no, we would not be capturing that. Same for the, the UDS data that we're reporting out. Again, only captures people that come through the door. And, you know, if they can't make it there, then because, you know, they can't get a babysitter or something, uh, yeah, that's that's a big gap in the data. Great, thank you. And then the other question that kind of preceded that was regarding um, your the section that you presented on the total number of health center patients that dropped in in 2020. And uh, they asked if while those patient populations drop, did you see kind of a rise in um, a, a double or a general increase in the rise in legal uh, social determinants, determinants of health problems? Um, so when I was showing the patient numbers that declined, that was taken from the uniform data system. Uh, and unfortunately we don't get a whole lot of info, information about you know, the number of patients visits for legal services. So we can't do kind of a crosswalk one-to-one uh, this many patients declined, legal services changed, uh, X number of patients. But what we did see is, you know, in the, the health centers that provided or referred for legal services, you know, at, I would say at least a third said that they saw an increase uh, at the same time too. So uh, I think, you know, the pandemic, it's pretty clear that there are some significant increases in legal uh, assistance services too. Uh, for sure. And I think also those legal assistance services may also tie in to some of the other enabling services that were listed on that slide. So we asked about legal services specifically, but we also asked about housing separately. And to the extent that you, those two are entangled, you know, uh, that might also indicate increased need uh, for legal services for housing. And Catherine, we had a question come in about um, uh, push uh, push for increases in navigator funding with that um, you know unwinding of the PHE in mind, and we did see you know significant um, and abysmal. Uh, I think it's fair to say that decreases in navigator funding over the last couple of years, and there was a push to increase. And so I just plugged in the chat. Um, to answer Amber Kirchhoff's question, um, a, an HHS uh, news announcement. There are several others out there from uh, third-party sources and other media. Um, I'm sure, Brad, your colleagues at KFF probably also covered this. You might see some stuff in health affairs um, talking about the increase in funding. And it was um, as a result of not just uh, folks internally within the administration who recognized the need to um, better address access to coverage um, through the the um, amazing work of navigators and um, certified application assister programs around the country, which include, by the way, le included legal aid programs um, uh, through MLPs. Um, but um, I think the coalitions that are inclusive of everyone from, you know, Georgetown CCF, folks are um, Geiger Gibson, uh, people on the Partnership for Medicaid, um, NAC, APCHO, others that all work together in this space, um, certainly pushed um, in their coalition efforts to um, increase uh, the support and resources needed for the navigators to assist folks with coverage. So um, Amber, hopefully that, that news announcement helps to answer the question. If it's about future efforts, um, I uh, deliberately plugged a few of those organizations <laughs> so that you can, or coalitions so that you can follow them. All right, 
Brad, um, I'd like to hold on any other questions that may have come in for you for the general Q&A so that we can hear from Rosie. Um, Rosie Changwear is joining us here from APCHO today and she'll talk a little bit more about how um, health centers have again leveraged prepare uh, that standardized tool to collect SEOH data um, and better address it. Uh, she'll also address some findings uh, that they've co uh, uh, collected and reported on at APCHO. Rosie, I'll pass it on to you and um, Albert when, and if you're ready to address any questions, you're welcome to uh, unmute and come on camera. Thank you, Rosie, all yours. Great, thanks so much, Bethany. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me on this webinar today. I'm excited to be with you to talk about our work and prepare, um, our social drivers of health screening tool and protocol. So if we move to the next slide. Um, so uh, just just wanting to, oh, actually the previous slide um, is fine, but um, just uh, you know happy to talk to you about prepare today. I wanted to make sure that um, I acknowledge our collaborators at the National Association of Community Health Centers we wouldn't be able to do this work without our valuable partnerships. Um, and so next slide. I am um, with this presentation, I wanted to talk to you about um, uh, just go over a brief intro of prepare share some of our data findings, um, share how some of that data has been used and share some of the data resources, you know, we want to be able to emphasize the use of data, not just collecting it as well. So I wanted to feature that in this presentation as well. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. So first of all, just uh, briefly, you know, what is PREPARE? So um, the purpose of PREPARE was to develop a standardized assessment tool that would allow us to collect uh, SDOH OH data at the patient level. This tool is known as PREPARE, uh, stands for Protocol for uh, Responding to and Assessing Patients' Assets, Risks, and Experiences. Um, PREPARE is a uh, an assessment tool, but it's also a protocol of resources and a process to help uh, help you collect and use the data on social drivers of health. Um, to collect the data, we have both a paper tool as well as EHR, or electronic health record templates to collect the SDOH data in the EHR. We also have um, mapped the prepare response choices with uh, you know, affiliated um, you know, ICD-10 Z codes, LOINC and SNOMED codes to help standardize the coding of the SDOH data and uh, to be able to compare the SDOH of different patient populations who see different types of providers as well. Um, and let's go to the next slide. I wanted to uh, do a poll uh, before I go further into explaining what PREPARE is. I'd like to see how familiar you are, you all are with the tool. So I wonder if we can launch um <clears throat> this tool here thank you okay just give you a minute to fill out that tool or that poll okay Okay, so it looks like, I think it's sort of stopped now. Um, it looks like a, a good number of you are familiar with the tool, but there's also a good majority that are not. So I'll, um, I'll try to explain this, uh, what this tool is a little bit further. Some of you are not sure as well. So happy to explain this further. Um, so let's uh, move on to the um, next slide if I think we're done with the poll. Whoops, I think I need to X out of this, okay. Okay, so um, so what is prepare and and you know what I explained to you that it's a standardized tool to be able to uh, capture the social drivers of health. So here's a glimpse of the domains that are assessed uh, in prepare. On the left hand side, the core measures. Um, there's 16 core measures. These core measures were uh, identified by um, stakeholders, a lot of health center stakeholders, and others that participated in the pilot and. Um, who uh, judge these to be the most important domains or measures. And then the nine measures that are outlined um, in, in red are reported by health centers as part of the uniform data system. So, uh, you know, these measures can are automated within um, health centers, electronic health records to make the, uh, the collection, data collection um, much more, uh, much easier for them. Um, on the right hand side under optional, you'll see uh, our optional and optional granular measures. 
Um, when we were developing this, the health center staff and stakeholders agreed that these measure, measures are important, but felt that health centers should decide whether or not, um, health centers or other uh, organizations should decide whether or not to use them based on their staffing and resources available um, at their clinic or at their organization. So you see the variety of um, measures there. Um, and uh, you can see uh, the, uh, it covers race, ethnicity, veteran status, farm worker status, English proficiency, income, insurance, neighborhood, and housing status um, from the UDS, as well as education, employment, material security, social isolation, stress, transportation, housing stability, and then the optional measures there of incarceration, uh, safety, domestic violence, and refugee status. And you can find the tool on our website at prepare.org. <clears throat> oh, next slide, please. Um, just wanting to share with you uh, um, why, why our stakeholders are interested in using Prepare to collect SDOH data. So there, there are a variety of reasons. Um, here are some of them. Um, one is that Prepare is actionable. Uh, we have a free implementation and action toolkit that talks about these examples to support users in implementing Prepare and taking action on patient social needs. Uh, in addition, as I mentioned, it's standardized and widely used. Um, and we typically standardize the need rather than the question. Um, and measures, as I mentioned earlier, are linked with standardized codes like the ICD-10, uh, Loic and SNOMED. It's also um, evidence-based and stakeholder-driven. Um, as I mentioned, PREPARE was informed by um, stakeholders and, and the existing evidence base as well on social risk um, and national efforts to address the social risk. So it was built, vetted, and tested with health centers and health organizations across the, across the US. It's also designed to accelerate systemic change. Um, PREPARE data, for example, can be used to demonstrate patient complexity through the development of um, risk stratification, for example, and ensures a, a, an ability to better target complex patients in need of uh, enabling services or social interventions, um, such as referrals and case management. Um, in addition, uh, PREPARE is patient-centered. It was basically created in a way to facilitate conversations and build relationships with patients. Um, we've heard from many health centers that uh, PREPARE has helped build these relationships with patients um, and PREPARE has also um, been translated into 26 languages, or actually about 30 languages now, um, also has a decline to answer option for all questions to re respect uh, patient's choice to respond. So those are just some examples of um, why um, <clears throat> our stakeholders uh, have used PREPARE uh, to collect SDOH data. If we move on to the next slide, I can um, share with you some of the UDS uh, 2020 data that indicates how PREPARE is the most dominant SDOH standardized screening tool used by health centers. Um, and uh, we're also excited that there's an increase in health centers using PREPARE um, from 35% in 2019 to 53% in 2020. And we'll also look at the 2021 data that's uh, just come out as well. Um, if you move on to the next slide, uh, um, we've, um, we're, we're excited to see also that there was an increase in states reporting, um, next slide please, states reporting 90% or more of health centers using PREPARE. So for example, in the states of Missouri, Arkansas, North Dakota, Wyoming, and Utah, um, they all have 100% of health centers using PREPARE. Um, in the states of uh, Iowa and Kansas, uh, over 90% of health centers use PREPARE. Um, and you can take a look at uh, more links um, on our website uh, regarding this as well. So um, next slide, please. Uh, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about why collect, why our stakeholders collect SDOH data, and specifically why um, standardized data on SDOH. Um, so there's a, a health centers and others are increasingly using um, social risk screening tools such as prepared to, to better understand, document, and address the root causes of not just poor health, but of inequities. Having this data integrated into systems can allow teams internally and externally to collaborate to proactively assess and address uh, their client's social risks, which um, health centers and stakeholders have been able to use to guide local partnerships and accelerate alignment. So this uh, diagram kind of provides some examples of use cases of um, 
of uh, how the, the social determinants of health data from prepare has been used uh, from patient to policy level um, in alignment with this vision. So um, you can see here uh, on, from individual level to policy level on the patient and family level, uh, you know, helps with uh, improving health and well-being, better manage patient and population needs, um, uh, design care teams and services deliver uh, more uh, whole person care um, on the local level to help integrate care through cross-sector partnerships and develop community level strategies uh, for prevention. Also has been used to execute payment models um, on the payment level and then to ensure capacity for serving complex patients um, on, the, on the policy, state and national policy level. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> So let's um, let's move on to the next question, our next slide, which is a poll. So we'd like to hear from you uh, regarding your experiences here. Um, uh, for those of you that uh, have uh, are familiar with prepared and um, are using prepared data, does your organization does your organization share the data with your uh, care team members with your organization? <clears throat> okay, great. Um, I think the responses are, are uh, stabilizing here. Um, so great, I'm, I'm glad to see that for the majority of you, you do use and, and share the, the data with uh, care team members. So that's great to hear. Um, love to perhaps hear a little bit more about that if we have time later. Um, let's see, click out of this. Okay, great. So um, if we're ready, we can move on to the next slide. So I wanted to next share with you just some um, just some analyses we've done with the prepare SDOH data, um, just to give you a flavor of what uh, what some of the national trends are. And um, we we published this in a um, paper as well. And I can um, in a I think which journal was that the uh, health health uh, journal of healthcare for the poor and underserved. Um, I think we have links to it later on. So. Um, so in this study, um, if you go to the next slide, um, with our pilot data, uh, we conducted a, a study um, that looked at, uh, concluded uh, seven health centers um, uh, and four of their respective health center networks over a course of a year, uh, located in a mix of rural and ur urban areas. So um, included uh, Oregon, um, New York, Iowa, Hawaii, um, and then uh, over a four month um, implementation period in 2015, three of these, uh, the teams piloted prepare implementation with their general patient population and the other uh, team implemented, implemented prepare with the chronically ill population. Um, and they all used a, a, a variety of workflows. So overall um, within our national cohort, uh, we collected data, prepare data on close to 3000 um, adult patients um, with the mean sample size for each team about 750 or so. So if we uh, <clears throat> move on to the next slide, um, here are some findings based on the national data. Um, so excluding demographic characteristics um, such as uh, ethnicity, which were high, um, the most common social risks we found were uh, poverty level, um, having Medicaid, uh, limited English proficiency, having less than a high school education, um, uninsured status, um, experiencing high to medium high stress, as well as um, unemployment. So um, just wanting to share with you some of these trends that included a variety of our um, uh, cohort pilot data. Um, so I wanted to also share with you, you know, how this data has been used, <clears throat> how the data could be helpful. So you know, data, this data has been used for a variety of reasons. Um, here we, you know, want to demonstrate how prevalent SDOH is for our, um, our CHC health center populations and share this to support needs for better funding and, and resource allocation for health centers and to advocate for community resource resources and needs for complex high-risk 
patient populations, you know, those with high risk needs. So um, this data have been used to show how prevalent SDOH is for these populations and how complex these um, health center patient needs are and the interventions that uh, health centers provide are uh, cost saving uh, for our country. So the federal government uses this to help justify appropriate resource allocation and funding needs for health centers, especially in the context of you know, past health center funding fiscal cliff threats. Um, in fact, some of our papers were featured in the president's budget justification across multiple years to show the need for continued funding for health centers to support um, their funding for this overwhelming a number of complex patients that they serve on a day-to-day -day basis, especially as compared to private providers. Um, and we've also used these results in meetings with you know, CMS advisory commissions to demonstrate that patients, health center patients, tend to have you know, multiple complex needs, not just, um, you know, for example, single social needs. So, um, so I wanted to share some of those, uh, how the data are used um, within this context as well. If we move to the next slide, I um, wanted to share with you how um, this is a distribution of SDOH risks uh, needs per patient. Um, and here, just wanted to demonstrate how um, virtually all health center patients faced at least one or two simultaneous um, SDOH risks. So, um, you know, virtually 100% uh, um, uh, had at least one or two simultaneous risks. And the proportion of patients facing at least three, four, or five simultaneous SDOH risks was also very high at 96%, 90%, and then um, 80% respectively. Um, the proportion of patients facing seven risks um, was about uh, 51%. Um, <clears throat> so that's, uh, you know, this is really helpful information to show how prevalent uh, simultaneous SDOH risks is for our, um, our patient and client population. So let's see, moving on to the uh, next slide. Um, I think here we wanted to just uh, hear from you how um, your organization uses the SDOH data, um, if you wanted to provide that in the chat to share some of those examples with, uh, with everyone else. And so I think, um, while we're doing that, um, I can, or maybe take a minute to, to do that if you'd like. Let's see, how are we doing on time? Okay. You're, you're good on time, Rosie. And Albert's also been addressing some of the questions oh. coming into the chat. So oh, I want to make sure that your question posed to the audience <laughs> gets answered in the chat as well. So I just want to make sure I um, emphasize on the screen, Rosie's posing to you all in the audience a chat question, um, you can chat to your answer to her. Um, how does your organization uh, currently use SDOH data? I think some of the questions to that are being asked, Rosie, um, uh, and posed to you and Albert, and Albert's trying to address actually are pertinent uh, to this question that you're posing to the audience. So it should lead to some really good conversation. Great, thank you, Bethany. Thank you, Albert, for um, addressing the questions. So, um, while you're doing that, we can move on to the next slide. Um, here, I just wanted to share with you uh, helpful ways of um, health centers, examples of how they use the data um, within their health center settings. So, um, you know, many health centers share health center-wide prepare data during monthly clinical quality committee meetings. Um, data can also be shared on a network or community level to show individual health center level data. So the data on the left-hand side in the blue shows the number of prepare screenings completed by each provider within one health center. This um, data uh, um, can also serve as a motivator to providers and their teams as they can easily see how they're doing compared to, to their peers. Sometimes that's helpful uh, to, to boost um, <clears throat> participation in the, in the screening for uh, care team staff. Um, within Tableau, which is where, where this uh, visualization is from, you can click on uh, one provider and then the data on the right will change so that you can see the SDOH risk score distribution by, by uh, provider or care team staff and across the health center or network um, for comparison purposes. The, um, uh, let's see. So yeah, I just wanted to share um, some of this information. I can share more about our risk score calculation if you'd like later on. 
Um, but yeah, I think these are some helpful visualizations that um, the health centers have, you know, taken, um, have done uh, on their own initiative uh, that shows the, how, how they use the prepare data. <clears throat> So let's move on to the next slide. So um, I wanted to, we've done a variety of studies using prepared data, but here I th thought I'd talk to you about our study specifically looking at how social needs impact um, patient outcomes. Um, so if we move to the next slide. Um, so this study used uh, something called logistic model analyses to assess how, uh, how much more likely it is for patients to have controlled diabetes versus uncontrolled diabetes when the patient has these uh, prepare social needs that were collected. Um, so this sample included patients that were diagnosed, diagnosed with diabetes who were screened using prepare during a, a one year period um, at a health center. Um, the final sample included about uh, 1200 patients with close to a thousand controlled um, diabetics and a little over 200 uncontrolled diabetics. Um, we also did some uh, t-tests to compare the SDOH risk uh, for those with controlled versus uncontrolled diabetics. And so if you move on to the next slide, um, you'll see some of these results. So um, here are the results comparing uh, whether the controlled or uncontrolled diabetics uh, were significantly different from each other. So the results indicate here um, that compared to the controlled diabetics, the uncontrolled diabetics had significantly higher rates of the prepare SDOH, SDOH risks, um, including um, the the uh, items that you see, the, the um, domains that you see up at the top, uh, stress, challenges, accessing care, uh, food insecurity, uh, lack of housing, worry, worrying about losing housing, as well as phone needs. Uh, we also found some marginally significant differences in several other domains, including um, utility needs, uh, transportation safety needs, and also uh, um, legal aid needs. So um, you might find that of interest. Uh, so overall, this study analysis uh, demonstrates the association between the number of social risks with, uh, you know, worse disease outcomes, in this case with um, uncontrolled diabetes. <clears throat> so just wanted to share that as, a, as an example of a study that we've done. Um, and then I think if we have time, we can do another um, Zoom chat, unless um, there's already some engagement there, <laughs> trying to answer the last question. Um, but here I was just curious about, um, you know, what are barriers and potential solutions to using SDOH data if you um, aren't uh, currently using them so that we can share with our peers um, what are, you know, what are some of those potential solutions? Mute real quick. Rosie, folks are definitely engaging in the chat on all the questions you're posing. Let us know if you'd like us to read any out. Okay, no, that's great. Thank you for the update. So um, yeah, we can continue on um, in the next slide. Um, here, I think uh, you know we wanted to be able to show how prepared data, um, again, has been used on multiple levels um, from individual to system and policy level. These are examples of actual um, how, actu of actually how uh, prepared data has been used. So you can see again um, on the individual level, data has been used to help expand services within the clinics. Um, you know, if, uh, for example, if, um, if they're finding, if an organization is finding uh, that, you know, legal needs are a, uh, are one of the top needs, then, you know, they're able to use that data to um, help work with, uh, um, work with legal uh, services agencies to uh, develop some of those um, uh, services that they can refer their patients to. Um, and then on, on a population level to build, uh, they've used the data to help build, um, you know, these partnerships with local organizations. And they, as I mentioned, you know, from transportation to, as I mentioned, legal aid needs to housing, um, uh, to, you know, uh, partnerships with Medicaid agencies that can be, um, co-located co with the health center um, <clears throat> and on the policy level to inform payment uh, reform with health health plans. So there's some um, some more examples for you to be able to 
kind of get a flavor of how um, the prepare data has been used to improve care delivery and health outcomes. So um, let's see, how are we doing on time? Okay. So let's um, move on to the next slide. Um, I wanted to talk to you about our current social interventions initiatives. Um, so in our current initiatives, you know, we've been building on our SDOH data collection protocol to better understand social interventions that address SDOH. We've been getting more and more um, requests and interest from the field about wanting to better understand not just the SDOH within PREPARE, but the interventions that are used <clears throat> to address those SDOH needs. So um, before I go forward with this, I just want to clarify um, how we define um, social interventions. They do include enabling services. Um, so they're, they're non-clinical services that address non-medical health-related social determinant of health needs. Um, <clears throat> and they include these uh, services you see on the left here, including you know, care management and referrals, to um, uh, community-based organizations like for food, housing, and transportation in order to address these needs. Um, they also go, these uh, social interventions also go beyond just providing per referrals um, and include interpretation, education, uh, counseling, financial el eligibility assistance um, for public health um, programs as well. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, um, uh, you know, I, there've, um, as I mentioned, you know, there's been interest in tracking these social interventions. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the link between social needs and social interventions and why um, social interventions data collection is also important to track in addition to uh, social needs. So, you know, by collecting uh, social needs, you, you have, as I mentioned, you know, a comprehensive understanding of the patient's social needs. And then by uh, simultaneously tracking the social interventions that you use to address the positive social needs, you'll better understand the gaps um, in the patient's social care needs. Um, so, you know, this is this is becoming uh, more prevalent. Uh, recently, NCQA um, released a report proposing um, HEDIS measures for social interventions. Um, and um, so, for example, they're uh, in 2023, they're going to start tracking the percentage of members who um, uh, were screened at least once for uh, social needs, um, but also if if screened positive, whether those uh, patients or clients received a corresponding intervention. So, you know, we we all recognize the importance of uh, social interventions, um, not just tracking you know the social needs, but what we're what organizations are doing to to um, track the social interventions that are used to address the positive needs as well. So um, <clears throat> this data you know, can, has, other, uh, has other benefits as well. It can help social care providers also better understand their levels of staffing efforts um, and resource needs to be able to continue to fund social interventions and the impact these interventions have on healthcare delivery outcomes and costs as well. Um, and also, especially uh, on an organizational level, the data can also help prioritize services for um, specific, specific subpopulations and allocate limited uh, resources, um, which you know we're we're seeing, which we're um, you know we're seeing trends of. of. Um, but ultimately, you know, the data, the standardized data, promotes a common language for different sectors to better align on upstream initiatives to advocate for needed social interventions. You know, changing policies in systems to repair the uh, inequities in our system. Um, <clears throat> let's move on um, to the next slide. And I just wanted to share with you some of the uh, social intervention um, activity categories in our prepare um, social interventions protocol. Um, you know, as, as um, you may have uh, seen in some of our enabling, our actual enabling services um, presentations, um, you know, there's a possibility of responding in multiple ways to address the prepare, prepare social needs. So these are um, different uh, different codes to be able to share or document or track um, the activities used to address the positive uh, social needs of patients. So you can see here um, the variety of these uh, assessments, um, social care management, uh, referral, um, and then closed loop referral, which is a something that we are really interested in um, tracking as well. And if you go to the next slide, you can see the um, other social intervention um, categories as well with eligibility assistance, education, supportive counseling, uh, interpretation, outreach, um, transportation, as well as other. 
So um, in the next uh, in the next slide and poll, I wanted to see how prevalent this is um, within the audience here, if your organization is tracking these social interventions. Um, so you can take a minute to uh, answer that poll question. It's, it's great to see the majority of you are tracking um, social interventions provided. So that's great. Um, that's great to see that. And it'll help make um, meeting some of those uh, new NCQA measures easier for you all as well. So that's great. Uh, great to see that. Thank you for answering that poll. I'll, show, I'll turn that off. Um, then if we go to, oops, let me turn it off here. Um, <clears throat> if we go to the next slide, I just wanted to share with you some examples of other reporting metrics um, that you can uh, use um, with the, the collection of social interventions. So um, as I kind of referred to earlier, you, you can look at the number of positive SDOH screens and the uh, corresponding social interventions that you've provided um, you know, by a variety of uh, indicators, such as by month, by category, by care team type. Um, the number of uh, interventions that were addressed compared to the number of remaining positive prepared social needs. Um, you can look at the top uh, needs that um, and interventions uh, that lack or the top social needs that lack a community intervention so that you know what to prioritize in working with communities to um, ensure that those uh, resources are available for patients. You can also um, understand uh, the amount of labor um, uh, required to uh, provide those social interventions, and this can help with reimbursement, for example. Um, so the mean length of time spent on social interventions by you know category or provider type, um, and then for the closed loop um, categories, uh, you know you can you can better understand uh, patient referral status. You know how much is uh, is our patients um, completing the referrals, or whether they're lost to follow up. Um, by social intervention, by organization, et cetera. So those are some um, ideal uh, uh, reporting that can be done um, as a result of tracking um, <clears throat> these social interventions in addition to the social needs. So I think I was um, going to stop there um, or actually just go over these uh, resources, maybe go to the next uh, slide or the slide after that. Um, to just look at, uh, just to share with you some of the resources available to support uh, prepare implementation. Um, all, all these can be found on the website. Oops, I think there's a typo. Um, prepare.org um, with P R A P A R E. I think that must have been an autocorrect. Um, um, so you can find a, a variety of these resources here. Uh, but I also wanted to feature on the next slide, there are a lot of resources to support prepare data use. You know, again, I wanted to emphasize uh, the data for action um, on, the, on the next slide there. Um, so um, if you go to the, the next slide, you can see the, um, the data, uh, the resources to support data use. So there's, uh, you know, show and tell templates. Um, there's handouts, um, templates that you can use, as well as, you know, poster data templates if you'd like to feature your data uh, findings. Um, there's also a variety of, of um, you know, how to's and fact sheets on how to leverage data for action. Some of our um, other uh, other fact fact sheets on some of our other prepare studies, um, looking at uh, high risk populations. Um, I think somebody I th I thought I saw asking about validation. So there's a prepare validation fact sheet as well. There's a variety of case studies and user stories as well. And I think all those. Um, should be linkable, uh, clickable um, there as well. So I think that's um, that's all that I have to share. Thank you so much, Rosie. Albert's doing an awesome job, actually, um, uh, multitasking to help us get uh, questions that were coming in, responses that were coming in to you um, answered as you presented. I also just plugged a link as folks will be waiting for the slide deck with all of those hyperlinked resources to prepare's knowledge and resource center site. Um, and so the APCHO team did let us know that that is a pretty comprehensive um, page if you all want to bookmark that um, as you await uh, slides. But Albert also shared his email. Um, Rosie, if I can, so that I make sure the folks who are still with us today 
um, pose a question to you um, in helping people think about moving from the information that Brad presented to you know utilizing what uh, data they're collecting through prepare and other screening tools to then better addressing the needs of the patient populations they're serving. Um, so the question I have um, is, um, can you, is it, if we have enough time here, can you tell us a little bit about how um, you can use all of that information to make referrals, but then do what's called closing the loop on that referral. So um, would you be able to share a little bit about capturing closed loop referrals? Certainly, um, yeah, if we, if we move actually to the slide um, 54, um, you know, we, or actually 53, sorry. Um, we, you know, we were very interested, as I mentioned, on um, tracking whether, you know, patients uh, actually close the loop on, um, on the referrals that they receive from, for example, for the health, cent health center. So a health center may refer them to a, an agency, um, or you know, food services, for example. So by um, using this referral code there on the bottom, we were able to, the, the um, health center and the community-based organization providing the food services are able to track whether um, the patient did actually reach the referral organization to, um, to have their needs for food addressed. So you can see there are a variety of, um, of categories that would select the, the status of the, um, the status of the referral, a uh, closed loop referral. Um, and so that health centers and CBOs, for example, can communicate with each other and then are able to better understand and address the, the patient needs as, as required. Thank you so much. I know a few folks had questions about, you know, referrals, um, referral only programs in the chat. And it really is, you know, the difference between going from a screening to just cold referrals out to going one step further to do the follow-up and tracking the intervention and the results thereof and allowing that information to also better inform how you carry out your intervention, especially medical legal partnership work. Thank you so much, Rosie. Um, I'm gonna move to the Q&A where folks um, are patiently awaiting with questions in there and then um, let the audience know that, you know, uh, to respect your time um, for the work that you're doing in the field uh, to carry out these interventions, um, we're gonna then wrap up. <laughs> so the questions that came in in the chat, um, Brianna and uh, White has been posing a question and Albert, can I, I'm gonna uh, actually pose this one to you. Um, I, th I think I've got this right. Um, so we have a CHW who's also a master's in social work practicum student at an FQHC in a rural area. And uh, the student is seeking any advice on how to really be best utilize, prepare. Um, Rosie, I know you provided a lot of tips. Um, Albert also shared some information about in the toolkit, how to help to promote and integrate and get others to do, you know, buy in to prepare. Um, but this um, CHW and master's in social work student is uh, noting that they sometimes use prepare to evaluate a patient's uh, SEOH needs, but it's really on a case by case basis. Um, so it's probably not, you know, the ideal or op they're probably not optimizing ways, the ways that they can utilize it. Um, Albert, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, um, Thank I you. mean, I had, an example from Maine that I wanted to share, and hopefully, um, feel free to email me. I'm willing to share kind of the case study, but um, the Maine Primary Care Association, which again is the representation of all health centers in Maine, was really able to aggregate data on the state level from the different health centers who were collecting data on transportation as a need, especially amongst rural populations. And they were able to work with the state transportation agency, as an example, to really figure out um, on a state level how to build more infrastructure and um, access to transportation, whether it's to like ride shares, mobile vans, et cetera, um, in Maine. And that was done through like a convention with different policymakers, payers, funders, health centers, community-based organizations. And so it's the key around aggregation. Once you start collecting more and more data, you'll be able to see the trends over time and do some policy and advocacy work, which can really transform the healthcare and social care system. So please email me. I forget who asked that question. I think Brianna. So willing to share more data. And uh, details. Thanks so much, Albert. And then last but not least, I know Margaret Holding Barrett has had a question in the Q&A. Um, I'll post this to Brad because I think it was in his data set that was presented on uh, health center challenges and then there was a highlight about the workforce. Um, so 
Brad, if you want to take a first stab at this, and then Albert and Rosie, I know as NTAPs, you know, one of our NTAP partners is also conducting a workforce survey, so there might be some additional um, uh, input that you want to chime in with uh, as this question is posed, um, and then we'll wrap up. <laughs> All right, so the question is, regarding the statistic that recruiting new employees is one of the biggest issues, can that be broken down any further regarding the reasons why? Sorry, I was muted. Yes, uh, it can be, certainly. And I believe uh, a few years ago, the National Association of Community Health Centers, NAC, did a workforce survey where they talked about what are the vacancies by which provider type, what are the like main challenges? Is it pay? Is it benefits? Is it uh, community uh, resources nearby, quality of life indicators? And they had, it was fairly comprehensive. Uh, the data, I mean, we're as of like 2017 or 2018. Uh, things probably changed during the pandemic, but that's where I would look to get a bit more detailed. Uh, unfortunately, that's probably a missed opportunity and something we'll, we might want to ask in future ones because it was such a huge and common theme in our, in our survey this year. Mm -hmm. And it's hard, and I'm sure, Brad, it goes beyond health centers, right, in terms of the recruitment and retention challenges for healthcare. Um, also, I just put, plugged into the chat a link to the current health center workforce wellness or well, well-being initiative that's underway. Um, and and um, so there's more to be seen here in the space. Albert, do you want to unmute? Thanks, Brad. Yeah, um, just anecdotally, but Hopefully we'll see this through the workforce surveys that are going to be administered through HRSA. But um, I heard from at least a handful of health centers in August when I was at the NAC conference that some of our health centers were losing medical assistance um, to like the COVID clinics that were paying them way more money. And, you know, it was about a living wage and being able to like feed your kids and, you know, keep your house and your lights on. And so we are seeing a lot of competition outside of the FQHC world from other, again, nonprofits perhaps that are paying higher wages and, you know, COVID definitely in a way um, influenced that and the workforce has been moving and shifting around the, the healthcare system. So just want to share that. Agree, totally agreed. I've heard from health center CEOs as well that they also try to address inflation and, and, and increases in gas prices by, you know, recognizing that their own staff, we were all experiencing a syndemic, right? Um, uh, multivariate um, causes of our challenges for both working and surviving all of these crises um, that we were also helping patients and clients to survive as well. Um, and so, yes, it's end all with that that survey that oh, surveys that will, and are being conducted <laughs> um, through HRSA. Um, look forward to receiving the data there because I think it really will inform not just what um, is pertinent to healthcare staffing and capacity but what is also absolutely necessary for us to carry out effectively the interventions um, that have uh, been shown to work well, such as medical legal partnership. But through this webinar, um, we really wanted to just pause for a moment and make sure we really understand what those data sets um, mean and how we can continue to utilize um, our go-to tools, such as prepare to continue to collect data on the social needs of our patient populations and then um, work with our other partners across disciplines in civil legal services to better address those needs. Um, I want to sincerely thank our friends and partners at KFF, Brad Corallo for joining us here today to talk a little bit more about the KFF annual survey and report, as well as Rosie and Albert from APCHO. They are our NTAP partners providing training and technical assistance resources to health centers around the country. Um, also to the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership team, I want to thank my team for helping to host today's webinar. If folks have, and we know you did because we've run out of time, um, additional questions in the chat that we were not able to address, we'll definitely take a look at that and see if in our follow-up email, sharing the recording link and slides if we can get some of those questions answered. But in the slide deck, you will have tips as well as resources shared um, that are already hyperlinked, and we'll just make sure we share that as soon as we can. Brad, Rosie, Albert, and to everyone in the audience, thank you so much for engaging in today's webinar, and we'll see you on the next webinar parts of the series. Take care and stay safe, everyone.